they'll see, but you don't have to. Okay, so we are now aware that we are now being recorded for this uh, class. Uh, as we start, I want to let you know the topic today is what is the church, who is the church, and what does the church do? So I just pulled a couple of books off of my shelf to show that you think the church is obvious. Here's a fellow by the name of Edward Schilibix, which is a great name if you're ever playing Scrabble, because how many times do you have that many E's and an X to put out there? But it's called The Church, The Human Story to God. And here I have Douglas Hall, who's a university professor, The Future of the Church, Where Are We Heading?, Here's Carolyn Fairless's The Space Between Church and Non-Church. And then uh, probably uh, Father Kyle's good friend, John Shelley Spong's book, Why the Christians Must Change, Why Christianity Must Change or Die. That's rather doer or dour. Um, here's a good sounding name, Robin Greenwood. Robin Greenwood, Transforming Church Structures. Here's another Edward Skillebeck's book, The Church with the Human Face. Here's uh, Avery Dulles, Cardinal Avery Dulles in the Roman Catholic Church, Models of the Church. David Watson, an evangelical from Britain, I believe in the church. Timothy Radcliffe, I wrote, Why, why go to church? With a question mark. And that's uh, Rublev's... Uh, picture of Abraham hosting three angels on the cover and another Roman Catholic theologian Hans Kung on on being a Christian so there's a lot of scholars and writers who are writing on what does it mean to be to be the church it's certainly not an easy topic I'm going to put up for us to share this this picture and where do I go over here uh, da, 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 da. where does it say start start a slideshow start with the current slide slide show so, uh, uh, from current slide. So here we are. There is our poster. So now I'm going to get into my topic, which again is confirmation number class number two. What is the church? Who is the church? And what does the church do? So what is the church? Some say it is an organization, like uh, as if you were going to go to and join a bowling society or a goodwill maybe the church is a a goodwill group like a, a giant charity focused association some say it's a building i'm going to go to my church in dartmouth i or i, I see a, a company is painting the church there's a little thing that i learned i don't know if you guys learned it when i was a kid my mother used to do this thing with her, her hands or get us to do with our hands here is the church here is the steeple open the door and you see all the people. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but that is sort of say here is the church is sort of implying that the church is the building. If you open the doors, you're going to see the people. If you open the church doors, you'll see all the people in the church. St. Paul says the church is the bride of Christ. Now that's interesting because it's saying the bride is actually a person, a person who is wedded to Christ. And he talks about husbands, love your wives, wives, love your husbands, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So he uses a metaphor of the Christ, uh, the church being almost a, a personhood of the church being the spouse of Christ. John Calvin, a, a theologian during the Reformation, said the church is wherever the word of God is preached and the sacraments are celebrated. So what he's saying is just like if you go to church on Sunday, you hear the scripture being read and then the sermon and you hear and you can get the Holy Communion or or you can you can have a, a baptism or you can attend an, a confession and absolution of your sins. So the sacraments are being celebrated in that gathering. So it's he calls when that gathering appears and stands forth then, he's writing like a 15th century person would write, then the church has come into existence. And that's from John Calvin's first chapter on the church, Article 9, in his book of uh, essays called The Institutes, written back in the 15, 1400s, 1500s. 
the catechism, which is like the Sunday school program in our book of common prayer says, what is the church? The church is the family of God, the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit. What do we say about the church? We believe that it is one, holy, Catholic, and by Catholic we mean the word, the Greek word Catholic, universal, and apostolic. It sprung out of the apostles that followed Christ. Why is it called one? Because it has one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Why is it called holy? It's called holy because the Holy Spirit dwells in it, sanctifying all its members and endowing them with gifts of grace. And why is it called Catholic? Because it is universal and holds for all time, in all countries, and for all people, the whole truth as it is in Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's from our Book of Common Prayer, which is on page 552. And that's somewhat shortened. This beginning is also in our Book of Alternative Service. The Church is the family of God, the body of Christ, and the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't have a tendency nowadays to talk about the church as the bride of Christ, but we certainly talk about the church as the body of Christ. We are the body of the Christ, says many of the hymns that we sing. Two modern day theologians, Henry de Lubac, uh, who is a, uh, a Roman Catholic theologian, and John Zinziolis, who is a uh, Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox perhaps, or I think he may have been uh, from Turkey, says that the church is the body of Christ. We just said that a minute ago, the church is the body of Christ. But we also call the Holy Eucharist, the bread that we receive at the time of, uh, of Holy Communion. We also call that the body of Christ. And they said that the church, the assembled body of Christians, celebrates the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion, and the bread becomes the body of Christ and the wine Christ's blood. And on the occasion of the Holy Communion being celebrated in share, that what's, is what makes the assembly of the church. So the church makes the Eucharist, the, being able to make and share the Eucharist makes the church. That's an interesting thing because uh, we were told by uh, uh, John Calvin that wherever the sacraments are celebrated, the church is. Now these two, so, well, these two theologians are saying, well, it's only where the sacraments are are able to be shared with each other. And not all churches, not all denominational churches will share their sacraments with one another. Um, some Lutheran churches will not share Holy Communion with us as Anglicans. Other Lutheran churches will. The Roman Catholic Church does not share Holy Communion with us Anglicans, although we would invite them to our services of Holy Communion. I mentioned in my own view last week that we have schools to shape our mental life. We have gyms and recreation grounds in which to exercise our physical life, so to grow mentally, to grow physically. And we have churches to gather in, to hear scripture, to pray and to praise and to nourish our faith with Holy Communion, and to inspire us and recharge our batteries to do ministry, to strengthen our spiritual side. Because for we as Anglicans and as Christians, we believe that people have brains, body and also spirit so we uh, ho we talk about people being well in mind body and spirit so we believe that there is a spiritual side of every person and the church is a place where we naturally go to feed and nurture and grow in our spiritual side on one level the church is an institution and i i hesitate to call it a business but you could say that the anglican church of canada is incorporated by law Originally, the British statute number 31 under George III, not Charles III, but George III in 1791, passed an act in the in, of governance for Canada, the maintenance and support of Protestant clergy in Canada, and established the Anglican Church as an institution in the New World. The Diocese of Nova Scotia is incorporated by law under the Anglican Church Act, Nova Scotia, which was last amended and passed in 1967. The church has a charitable tax number issued by Revenue Canada. The church has church laws called canon law, and it has regulations, policy, elections, licenses, and appointments. So on one level, it is an institution. But on another level, it's the mystical body of Christ. 
The mystical body of Christ is a scriptural image of the church drawn from the teachings of Christ and St. Paul that illustrates her unity in Christ, her relationship to him, and the interdependence of her members. We who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. Paul says in his letters to the Romans, he says it together at another time in his letter to the Romans, and he says, and in his first letter of St. Peter, they talk about the church being the people forming the church. The church is therefore beyond government, although we have a church government, it's beyond structure. It's a mystical body of Christ. It's beyond earthly things. It is a heavenly thing, a spiritual thing. And that's why sometimes you'll see on TV shows where judges in the courts will give certain permissions for clergy or to not have to be test to testify, to not break the bounds of, 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 of confessional. Um, there'll be things like that because the state recognizes the church as being a sister organization or is somehow independent of the state at some times. We call our church sanctuaries because under some countries, if, if somebody is wanted by the law or is trying to flee and declare refugee status, they can find a sanctuary in the church and the police will not go into a church building to arrest somebody. That's not in all countries. You will also see on TV shows where the police do go into a church uh, to arrest somebody, but it's very, very uncommon. So that's part one. What is the church? And I did not give you an easy answer because as you saw from all those books I, I mentioned at the beginning, it's a complicated thing. What is the church? So who is the church? Some people will say the priest represents the church. I'm the guy up at the front. I'm wearing the fancy collar. That's why we are so, so disappointed when we hear about clergy and sexual abuse or any form of abuse or any crimes done by clergy. You would think the priest is, is sort of a better person than that. They represent the church. Some say the priests are the church because they went to theological university and have those incredibly focused degrees. If you're going to go to university for seven years and study theology, well, then maybe they know better than anybody else. Some say it's the bishop. That's the boss of all the priests. The bishop calls all the shots, it seems. And some say it's the people who are the church. Since we said that, here's the church, there's the people, you know, the people. There are a thousand people in the pews for every clergy person. There are some six, 64,000 Anglicans in the Diocese of Nova Scotia, only one bishop, and only a couple dozen clergy. So. Who represents the church? The reality is, is that it is all of us. As we learned last week, all baptized persons, but even in the greater understanding of the mystical body of Christ, it is all persons, seeker, sinners, the faithful, all persons are children of God. If we hold to the old creation story in Genesis that God created the creation, even whether it's in the Big Bang or whether, or however it is, and, and was God for evolution. God is uh, the God of all humanity and all of creation and all animals and plants and all creatures, great and small, all things come of God. And so all people are children of God. And anyone who wants to follow Jesus Christ is a Christian. But all, ch all people are children of God through their uh, various faith groups but anyone of those people who want to follow jesus christ is a is a member of the church how is the church organized the people are called this term the laity so all of you are called lay persons and they make up 99.999 percent of the church and are commissioned to do ministry in accordance with their baptismal vows we saw that last week when we looked at the baptismal service the clergy are sort of professional coaches who are supposed to pray and inspire and coach and mentor and teach and lead and do all that sort of stuff. But you wouldn't say that a sports team is just the is just the referee or just the coach. The team is are the are the players. So in the church, the the, the clergy are the coaches and the mentors, and the people are the team. How is the church organized? There are three types of clergy, at least when we're talking about there, there's bishops, there's priests, 
and there's deacons. And those are the people from the laity who have been had hands laid on their head and are separated apart from the laity to take on the role of the leaders in the church or these coaches and mentors. And there's very strict requirements of education, of lifestyle, of such to become a priest, a bishop, or a deacon. Bishops are the clergy who have oversight of a large tract of land, which we call a diocese. So the Anglican Church of Canada has 29 dioceses, and each one of those dioceses are headed by a bishop. And the bishop, in their ordination vows as bishop, there's a, it says, John or Susan, the people have chosen you and affirmed you in their trust by acclaiming your election. So a bishop is elected. The bishop is the Holy Church of God. So they're called to guard the faith, to celebrate and provide for the administration of the sacraments, to ordain the priests and deacons, and to join in ordaining other bishops, and in all things to be a faithful pastor and a wholesome example, and with the, all the other bishops, share in the leadership of the church, both in the Anglican Church of Canada, but also in the leadership of the church throughout the whole world. So the bishops are called to do a lot of things, and a lot of it is strategic leadership. That's from our BAS, the ordination of a bishop. Bishops guard the faith, have strategic oversight of the church, Bishops, as we saw in our readings, or, or this comes from the Greek word episkopoi, which means overseer. It was translated into German at some point as episkopoi, and then uh, uh, into Old English as biskopoi, <laughs> drop the E, and then from Old English to Modern English, it went from biskopoi to bishop. bishop. They ordain other clergies. Uh, bishops can ordain other bishops, priests, and deacons. And they consecrate the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, and celebrate the other sacraments. Priests are clergy who have oversight of a smaller tract of land called a parish by license to the bishop. The bishop owns the diocese, and the diocese is divided into a bunch of parishes. I think we have 60-some parishes in the Diocese of Nova Scotia. Their tasks from their ordination vows, and again from the Book of Alternative Services, is that they are, the church is the family of God, the body of Christ, and the temple of the Holy Spirit. We heard that a minute ago. All baptized people are to make Christ known as Savior and our Lord, all baptized persons. But as a priest, it is their job to proclaim by word and deed the gospel of Christ. That's why the priest normally reads the gospel at the service on Sunday. Oh, sorry. And to fashion their lives in accordance with its precepts, to love and serve the people among whom they work, caring for young and old, strong and weak, rich and poor. They are to preach. So you normally hear the sermon coming from the priest and declare God's forgiveness after a, confirmation, after a confessional time to pronounce God's blessing at the end of the service. There's normally a blessing given by the clergy person right at the end. And they're to preside at the administration of holy baptism. Although they don't exclusively have to do that, in an emergency, any baptized person can baptize another one. And at the celebration of the mystery of God's body and blood, which is the Holy Communion, the Eucharist. So that's the job of priests. So to hear confession and absolve people of their sins, to bless and to consecrate Holy Communion, the Eucharist, and celebrate the other sacraments. Deacons do not have any oversight of any territorial piece of land. Their tasks from their ordination vows are to, as to a special ministry of servanthood. They are to serve people, all people, particularly the poor, the weak, the sick, and the lonely, and as a deacon, they are to study the Holy Scriptures. Many deacons go on to get doctorates uh, in, in Holy Spirit, in scriptural studies. They are to seek nourishment from the Scriptures, model their lives upon the Scriptures. They are to make Christ and his redemptive love known by word and example. So they're a bit to be evangelists. They are to interpret to the church the needs, concerns, and hopes of the world. And they're to assist the bishops and priests in worship. So there are not very many deacons. I would say we probably have maybe 12 or 14 deacons in the whole of the diocese. And I don't even know if we have any deacons in the Dartmouth region.
Does anybody here know if they have a deacon in their church, in their parish? We don't at St. Albans. So deacons have a clear ministry of service, servanthood. They're called to study. They're called to make Christ known. And they're called to advise the church about the needs and concerns and the hopes of the world. And to assist in services of Holy Communion, Eucharist, and other sacraments. So there are three types of clergy, bishops, priests, and deacons. But clergy are only 0.001% of the church. The clergy are very much in team ministry with licensed lay ministers. I think all of our parishes have them. All of the laity and members of religious orders. Now, I'm not going to talk at all very much about religious orders today, but you may have heard of the term monks or nuns or abbots or monasteries or convents, and those things exist in the world where members of the laity, or they could be clergy, they could be priests or deacons, join a monastery or a convent and take on religious vows to live in community and to have a particular focus of outreach. We kind of recognize those religious orders with that picture, monks, brothers, and nuns. So there's Whoopi Goldberg in the movie Sister Act. But I'm not gonna go any further than that, that that is an option and we do have monks and nuns. We have the brothers of the, uh, of the Agape out in Victoria. We have the sisters of St. John the Divine in Toronto and in Victoria. And we have other um, other religious houses in Canada. I'm not aware whether we have any Anglican religious orders in Nova Scotia. So I'm going to stop for a minute and I'll just do a quick survey. Do people want, I've been speaking now for half an hour, do people want to take a five minute break? Or shall I just continue on? I'm seeing no response. I'm asking for the first time. If I don't hear for a break, I'll just continue on. Okay, this is my second time of asking. Shall I take a break or shall we just continue on? Okay, break, break. We're hearing. Doesn't matter, matter from Trillium, but anyone. So let's take a five minute break. It is now one o'clock. We will resume in five minutes. So 105, please come back and be in. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to show your face or something so that I know that you're back with me. Okay, five minute break, everybody. Take care.
All right, everybody, it's 106. Can I get a little glimpse of your faces or a thumbs up or something to show that you're back? I'm back, says Trillium. Everybody else? Everybody else back? Thumbs up from Ethan. Very good. We're popping in, which is great. Hi, Owen. Thank you all. Very good. Thank you. So we are back. I will continue with our sharing of the screen. And I will say from this current slide, let us go. There. So break. We were finished. We're now in part three. The ministries within the church, which is what does the church do? So we've looked at <clears throat> what is the church and who is the church now we're going to look at is what well, what why the church i guess what does the church do and i think most people would say i hope you can see this and there's not a bar, black bar covering you but i think most people would say that what the church does is worship that is our our key that's what i would say 99 percent of what we do we you say we're going to go to church why are we going to go to church we're going to go to church for the worship service so worship is always what we're about, and it is always in our center. We worship and praise God. We worship and praise God in threefold form, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, sanctifier. But we also, my is not working for me again. Why is my, there, we also do a couple of other things. Now, this is a slide I've worked on during the week. It's I've never used this slide before, and I'm hoping it will be okay. So Give me, a, give me some time here. I'm going to have a little fun with you. So this is the other things that we do. We have evangelism, that's sharing our faith, charity, teaching, and, and Christian leadership. So worship, of course, is rooted in prayer. But there are different types of prayer. There's personal private prayer, like we would might call devotions, prayers that you say at home, maybe before bed. Uh, there's healing prayer, and then there's prayer that's gathered in the church. That's what we most often think about worship by the church. But there's a lot of personal private prayer, grace at meals, personal prayers, I said, during the day, prayers in time of emergency. I think there's a lot of people that are going for surgery today that might be saying a prayer. <clears throat> there might be some Ukrainians and Russians who are fighting a war <coughs> who might be saying a prayer. And there's also time when people go away on private personal retreats and they have private personal prayer or prayer in a retreat format. With healing prayer, there can be anointing with blessed oil in a hospital setting. There can also be last rites, which is one of the seven sacraments called unction. And that's a special type of healing prayer that we give when someone is very close to death or in hospice or uh, very near death when their time has come gathered prayer in church we have a thing which has not got communion you don't see it very often nowadays it's called morning prayer or matins and evening prayer or even song and those are called the daily office they're often done by monks or nuns but sometimes we do it in the parish uh, if there's not a priest available that sunday they'll have a matin service or an even song service gathered in prayer gathered in the church we have sacramental prayer, we have funerals, and we have music. These are things that happen during gathered prayer services. Sacramental prayer, baptism, which we saw, last rites, confession and absolution, Holy Eucharist confirmation, or consecration, uh, confirmation, uh, 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 deconsecrating and consecrating of a parish church, ordaining clergy. Those are all sacramental prayers. With weddings, we have nuptial blessings. And with funerals, we have the blessing of a grave. For music, we have people that do the playing of music, people that do the singing of the music, which would be our choirs, and the people that do the composing of the music. That's something that you have in our hymn book. So that's, those are all ministries in the church. So that's quite a chart there about worship. With evangelism, I said evangelism is sharing your faith or mentoring others in the faith, representing the church to the world or representing the world to the church. Over here under, 
under charitable leadership, we have food programs, clothing programs, housing programs, justice work, advocacy, cre creation crisis, hospital visiting, seniors care visiting, prison ministry, planning and arranging of other of all of these things, the administration of charitable leadership. So all of those, you can see some of those in those baptismal vows. Will you respect the dignity of every human being? Treating others with respect. In teaching, we have the preaching by the priest uh, or by whoever's giving the sermon in church, which is kind of a teaching moment, inspirational moment, I guess. Could be worship, could be evangelism too. We have Sunday school and youth events. We have adult education baptism preparation courses, confirmation courses like we're doing right now, um, uh, marriage preparation courses, teaching at a religious school, teaching at a seminary or a school of theology, so teaching people that are going to become deacons or priests, being a theological professor who teaches priests and deacons and advises bishops at councils, counseling, those are all teaching ministries. And leadership, we can have leadership at the parish, at the diocese, or at the national church. At the parish, we have our parish council. We have our financial treasurer who looks after things. The wardens, which are the one or two people that are elected to be responsible as lay people for the fabric and administration of the church building. Then we can have licensed lay ministers who uh, do those daily offices of morning prayer and even song and assist the priest. At the diocesan level, we have priests who are also at the parish level, priests in charge of a, of a parish, the rector. Uh, um, and at the national church and at the diocesan, one, we, are, we have a, a role in leadership of the church of strategic oversight. I've mentioned that before. So if we look at all of them, <laughs> that, I had fun creating that this week. This is our ministries within the church. Crazy looking slide that I created this week. So I'm, I'm sorry that you have your, you're all in black because I'm expecting this is what I would see if I was looking at your faces. And I'm hoping that this is not what I am looking like when I have my chart up there, that I look like the mad and crazy priest who's got all of that. But that is my picture of ministries within the church. Now, the reason I did that is because I wanted to show you that in yellow, are the ministries that are exclusive, not exclusively, that are done by deacons. Remember we said that they represent the church to the world and they bring the concerns of the world to the church. Here in blue are the ministries for exclusively for or that are in their ordination, the vows taken on by, by priests, anointing with blessed oil, doing last rites, confession and absolution, holy Eucharist and consecration, nuptial blessings, blessing of a grave, a uh, priest in charge and being a rector. Blue things are for the priests to do. The yellow things are for the deacons to do. And then the pink here is the role of the bishop. Confirmation, consecration and deconsecration of a parish church, ordaining clergy, and strategic oversight. So these over here, my whole point in making this giant great big map is that these are the roles of the clergy. Not that we can't do this. I sing in the choir when I'm, when I'm at church. I'm doing the confirmation preparation course right now. We can do that. But these are all the ministries. Everything here is the ministries that can be done by, are, are supposed to be done by lay people. Now, we don't expect you <laughs> to do every one of these. Even in your whole lifetime, you're not expected to do every one of these. However, these are all ministries that are open to you. And so the hope is that over your lifetime, you will find various parts of these ministries <coughs> that will resonate with your spiritual life. There may be a time when you want to say grace during meals. There may be a time when you gather for prayer in church. We hope it's a long time and it happens every Sunday. We, we, there may be a time when you get elected to be on parish council or even take the role as being the warden. 
there may be a time when you will assist in doing confirmation preparation courses like this or baptism preparation courses by other families in your parish. Who knows, you might become a theological professor one day. You might decide that you want to be part of the parish pastoral care visit and visit people in hospital. We were notified on Monday that a lady in my parish who's a long-term member of, of the parish is very close to death. So one of our members of our pastoral care team, a licensed lay minister who has taken on the role of being our hospital pastoral visitor, went to visit her. And I will try and go and visit her and give her last rites. But it was nice that she will get a visit from them. But they also lead worship services at Oakwood Terrace. So they do uh, a worship leadership in care home visiting. So that you might take up that role someday. So the laity are 99.999% of the church, the laity of a lot of ministries. And they get those ministries rooted through their confirmation and via their baptismal vows that we heard about last week. I had written, they are called to discern what ministries they are inspired to do. But really what I'm conveying to you today is that you are called to discern what ministries you are inspired to do. You are called to prepare yourselves by learning. You are called to be the church. So there, you are part of the great 99.999%. And that is my class for today. So... If you don't mind, I would ask if you would put your faces up so that I can see you, if, if that is okay with you. And I'm just going to ask, does anyone have any questions from what I presented today or any comments? You can do it through a face time, we're putting your face up. You can do it by just speaking or you can type it in as a chat. Any observations from today? Okay, my second time of asking, I'm do it three times. I always do this three times. Second time of asking, does anyone have any comments to share? Any questions? There is a lot to learn. Thank you, Trillium. That's why I said right at the beginning, it may have happened before you came, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that uh, you don't have to take notes and memorize all this stuff. I'm just giving you the information to wash over you so that you can take it in uh, there's no exam at the end. You don't have to cram or stress out. It will be reinforced by your reading. And it'll also be just so that you can say this was explained to me. So I, I heard this once. I, these are not terms that are unfamiliar to me. I would be embarrassed at the end of the course, though, if someone said, do you know what a bishop is? And you said, oh, I've heard about the bishop. The bishop is in charge of the diocese. That would be nice to know. We will be meeting the bishop at some point before the bishop of our diocese. We will be meeting her sometime before the this course ends, I hope. Okay, any other questions or observations, my friends? Okay, third and final time of asking. Are there any other questions, my good friends? No, I don't think so. I don't think so either, Owen. Thank you very much. So if you remember, I sent you out a revised chart of the schedule. I think I can actually throw that up, share on the screen. I think I have it over here under a word. Is it here? No, that's uh, here. Share this. So this is our class today. We had a, Sadly, we had our last one canceled due to Hurricane Lee. Thank you for sending that to us, the winds. So this is our faith. We read our we read our uh, homework assignment, hopefully in preparation. And then today I was on Zoom with what is the church, who are the church, the laity, and the three orders of the ordained ministry. And that's all that I want you to remember. What is the church? It's a mystical body of Christ. It is an organization. It is the bride of Christ. It is the body of Christ. Who are the church? We all are. And there are the laity and the three orders of ordained ministry. Now, during this next week, we have another homework assignment from chapter six, pages 105 to 118, a little bit longer, but it's a little bit about introduction to Jesus. 
And next week on the 1st of October, we will be back in session at Christ Church, back at that room that we met on upstairs, not at the church itself, but in the church hall upstairs in the, or not upstairs, in the church hall with Dr. Kyle. And the topic is going to be, who is Jesus and why are we his disciples in the 21st century? And we'll have, again, an introduction of that letter to the bishop. So we will have that class next week. And remember, we will have no class on Thanksgiving Sunday, which follows. So this is going to be interesting. You have a class, then a holiday, a class, then a holiday. This is going to be an interesting program for you. Anyway, so you'll be gathering with Dr. Kyle. I'm afraid I will not be able to join you next week because I have an aunt who is coming from Florida and she is going to be in Halifax for one day only on Sunday, the 1st of October. And my brothers and sisters uh, and their wives and, and some of my cousins are going down to meet her uh, down in Eastern Passage. And we're going to go to Boondocks and have a nice seafood lunch with my aunt. My mother is from Eastern Passage. And so she's coming back to visit with some of her brothers and sisters here. And we are going to gather with her for lunch. And unfortunately, it starts at noon and we won't get out until about 2. So I will not be able to join you next Sunday, but Father Kyle will be with you. So that being said, we are now caught up. Please uh, consider doing your reading homework. And I will see you after on the other side of, the, uh, of that when we will be back on Zoom again on the 15th. But we'll all be sending you out a reminder about that. But before we go, let us, let us pray. Let's just take a moment to still ourselves. And let's say a prayer. Loving and holy God, we give thanks for the church, the body of Christ which surrounds us, supports us, and allows us to contribute. We give thanks for our brothers and sisters, some that we see in the pews when we come to church, some who lead us in the singing, some who look after the grounds, some who repair the building, and all of us who work in ministries and senior homes, visiting the elderly, the shut-ins, working in food ministries and housing ministries and clothing ministries, going to visit people in prison and bringing them Holy Communion, who assist at the altar and do all of these things for us and with us. We ask that you fill us with your presence. Bless us, bless our families, bless our friends and our, those that we love. In Christ's name we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you all, everyone. Take care, and I'll see you on the 15th of October, it would seem. God bless. Take you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. See ya. See ya. I got to figure yeah. out how to turn off this recording. <laughs>